Good morning. I'm Lori McGinnis. I'm director at the Center for Transportation Studies here at the University of Minnesota. Welcome to the public forum portion of our two-day symposium on the sharing economy. I know many of you attended yesterday's research workshop, and many of you are new here today. So welcome to all of you. I, I know from our planning stages that what's ahead will be a little different flavor than the research workshop. So it, I think we've got this great mix over these two days of really an academic focus on what are some of the research questions, and today's focus, which is a, broadening out to include industry, nonprofit, public, private sector representation here. So we want to hear from that group about some of the challenges and questions they have. Well, it's clear the sharing economy is with us. It's not something that's going to happen in the future. It's not something that's happening to somebody else. It's happening to all of us. So how many in the room have participated in the sharing economy? That's great. It is one of my personal goals to have someone help me download Uber on my phone before the end of this conference. <laughs> it, would be, it would be embarrassing if I don't have that taken care of by the end of this conference. So yesterday we heard some of the research descri researchers describe their work regarding the potential impacts and implications of the sharing economy and to help us think about whether or not it's here to stay because there are some things that are, are still questionable. Is what we have now what we'll have in two, three, five, ten years? And, and that's really difficult to say. It was clear from the level of discussion and participation and the number of equations displayed on the screen that the experts in the room were speaking the same language. Me, not so much. But I did learn a lot without question, and we're going to learn a lot more today. But in today's portion of the program, we have banned the use of equations. So you can rest easy there. But we do want to continue the lively discussion and engagement of the audience. So please be thinking of your questions, record your questions. We'll have, with, with each speaker and each panel, we will have opportunity for question and answer and dialogue. The symposium is one of the first major activities we've undertaken as part of our initiative on the sharing economy. This is a joint program of CTS and the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering at the University of Minnesota, and we launched this in 2015. Saif Benjafar, who you're going to hear from in a few minutes, serves as director of the initiative. The initiative has four broad objectives. Support the development of the University of Minnesota as a center for thought leadership on these issues. To cultivate a cross-disciplinary community that draws on faculty and researchers from schools and departments across the university. Encourage university-driven entrepreneurship and innovation for the sharing and on-demand economy. And last but not least, promote engagement with industry, government, and the nonprofit sector and to provide balanced analysis and guidance to policymakers. Today's forum is central to that fourth objective. As you can see when you look around the room and when you check your list of attendees that's been provided in your packet, you'll see we have an amazing mix of attendees and presenters from the academic sector, industry, government, and nonprofit organizations. I encourage you all to meet with someone that you don't know already and to think about potential ways to collaborate on something related to the sharing economy. A special thanks to Saif for his leadership in creating the conference and pulling together the, the exciting and dynamic program that we have. And also a special thank you to Hannah Grun from CTS, who did so much to coordinate and make this all come together and hopefully make your experience really smooth and pleasant over, over these two days. Because our agenda is very full, we will not be taking much time to t introduce the individual speakers. Please, again, refer to your packets for brief bios about each of our presenters. Our opening session includes two presentations. We'll begin with Saif Benjafar speaking on the promise and perils of the collaborative consumption, and he'll set the stage. Saif is a distinguished McKnight professor in industrial and systems engineering, and as I mentioned, director of this initiative. Following Saif is Bill Dossett, executive director for Nice Ride Minnesota. One thing you won't read in Bill's bio is that he is the newest member of the CTS Executive Committee. We're really pleased about that and looking forward to working with him as we carry out our activities at CTS. And in, in addition, he's a very generous guy. I want to personally thank Bill for a donation he made to this event. He provided three-day passes to our out-of-town guests for the symposium, and we hope that 
<laughs> we hope that many of you had a chance to take advantage of that. Bill's topic is governance models for public-private partnership. So following Saif, we will have time for some Q&A, and then we'll move on to Bill and have Q&A with that. Is it on? Yes. yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Uh, great. So um, for those of you who were here yesterday, this is a bit of a repeat. Uh, uh, for those of you who are uh, who are new to uh, who joined us uh, uh, who joined us, uh, um, hopefully this will give you um, an overview. Laurie asked me to uh, to give a, a kind of a paint a broad picture of uh, issues around the sharing economy. Uh, and um, some of the perils, the promise uh, that the sharing economy uh, um, uh, holds. Okay, so uh, here's the agenda. So I will start talking about uh, highlighting uh, uh, some of the promise of the sharing economy, talk about the perils, pitfalls, uh, harm that may come from the sharing economy, uh, talk a little bit about the, the idea of the initiative of the sharing economy, uh, at the University of Minnesota, and then just give you a flavor, you know, I, I couldn't resist. <laughs> We're gonna show any equations, <laughs> but I had to give uh, uh, folks here hopefully a glimpse of the kind of research that is ongoing. Um, and hopefully it makes sense. Okay, some of you might have seen this, um, this statistic, all right? Uh, some of you might ha have read, uh, right, uh, Rachel Bozeman's book, uh, uh, so, Let's see, so there are 80 million power drills in the US, any point in time, you buy these things. And I guess the um, average usage over a lifetime of a power drill. <laughs> it's uh, uh, not even close. Uh, a power drill is used on average of 15 minutes, okay? Uh, so there is, um, right, there's an opportunity, right? These things are, I mean, this is an example of the many things we own. We own a lot of stuff. Some of this stuff is, um, is poorly used, and some of this stuff, so this is a cute example, but some of the stuff that, that is poorly used is actually expensive. So uh, since this is an event uh, um, with the focus on transportation, right, uh, um, there are 254 million registered cars in the U.S., uh, over a billion in the world, and I'm sure all of you know the statistic about uh, the usage of a car, right? Uh, it's uh, less than 5% in the U.S. Uh, so there is, um, everybody can see the, the slides? Yes? Okay, maybe we can, we can do that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so, so again, right, uh, there's um, um, cars are these, uh, the, an example of this expensive asset, uh, rapidly depreciates, occupies valuable real estate, right, we're, we're parking, parking, uh, parking uh, garages, parking ramps, etc. So there is um, uh, there's, uh, uh, an opportunity to leverage this excess capacity and do interesting uh, things with it. Uh, um, so similarly for other um, privately owned means of transport, whether it's bikes, boats, airplanes, spaces, parking garages, office spaces, uh, um, extra bedrooms and private homes, uh, and many other categories of household goods, okay? Uh, so the, 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 the essential idea, right, the essential insight of the sharing economy is that one could leverage this excess capacity. Uh, um, um, and um, uh, this increased awareness, right, 
of, um, of this idle capacity in, in, in the economy uh, has, um, has led to this growing trend uh, toward a shift away from exclusive ownership and consumption of resources to one of shared use and consumption. Uh, there has been an explosion of businesses uh, that are tapping into this, this idea in the last five years. Uh, the two spectacular successes is Uber, Lori mentioned it, valued at $60 billion. Uh, Airbnb, now the largest uh, hotel chain in the world, uh, if you may, in terms of number of rooms, uh, and, and number of stays per day. Uh, it's also valued uh, right at uh, uh, over $30 billion. Uh, so again, the, the growth in the sharing economy has taken advantage of excess capacity for many categories of products. Uh, um, the idea of sharing, the, 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 the opportunity to share has always been there, but now it is uh, greatly facilitated through these online platforms, right, that are reducing uh, search costs, transaction costs, handle uh, payments, uh, and also weed out bad uh, actors in the system through these two-way reputation systems, right? You as an owner of an asset, you can rate the user, the user can rate you, and these, uh, these uh, sort of self-regulation, right, uh, to some extent is expected to take care of, uh, of the bad apples, if you may. Uh, this is also taking, uh, uh, taking advantage of demographic, uh, cultural trends, increased, increased population density, uh, um, greater awareness, uh, sustainability, generational, also shifts in attitudes. The sharing economy uh, is part of this bigger thing that is, that is going on, this notion of the on-demand economy, right? Where you'd access uh, products and services as you need them, right? It's, uh, uh, again, there are businesses, uh, services uh, around uh, that facilitate this on-demand access to products, services, financing, uh, um, crowdsourcing. Uh, it's also part of this phenomena uh, called, uh, by some, uh, serviceization, which is a, a shift. So a lot of firms are shifting away from selling physical products to selling the functionality of these products, okay? So I think of data storage instead of, think of a cloud computing, right? Uh, data storage instead of your hard drives, printing services instead of printers, mobility instead of cars, uh, right? The GE made the name for itself by selling, instead of selling engines for, for airplanes, they sell, uh, they sell power, right? They, they charge, Per hour, per hour or per mile that an engine is running an airplane. Uh, this is also driven by the rise of the platform economy, if you may. So I like this quote. Uh, uh, Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, which is this big, um, uh, right, uh, sort of an, um, a version of eBay, Amazon, all combined, and China, the most valuable retailer in the world, has no inventory. Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Uh, something interesting is happening. Uh, just to bring some drama to the scale of the sharing economy, I like this picture. This is now a bit dated, 2014. The numbers are, are probably doubled for many of these. Uh, but just two, two things to highlight here. Uh, so I mentioned Airbnb. So this is a particular day, right, uh, in 2014. So in 2014, uh, let me see. Uh, Airbnb, 375,000 people uh, stayed in rooms booked through Airbnb worldwide. And uh, on this particular day, 160,000 people booked rides or, or, or taken rides on Uber. That number is now a multiple of that, certainly the case of Uber. This is a cute picture in The Economist, appeared uh, 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 a year ago. We're showing these various, so behind each one of these, there's an actual business, all right? Uh, a sharing economy business where you can, 
where you can rent your lawn mower, you can rent a room, your, your truck. Uh, you can even have somebody walk your dog or borrow your dog. And there's, a, there's, a, there's a business called Borrow My Doggy, <laughs> where you can, uh, right, so for a few hours have the enjoyment of a dog. If you don't want the, uh, if you, so this is this whole idea of unbundling things, right? So you don't have to buy a car, you can buy a fraction of a car. You don't have to have a pet, you can have a fraction of a pet. Taking it to extreme. Um, and um, so mobility and transportation has been, has been, has been uh, um, a great application of sharing economy ideas. And my own personal interest has been in this idea of peer-to-peer -peer product sharing, uh, including in the context of cars. So, uh, um, and so in the US, a good example of this is get around. So this is a different model where you, as an owner of a car, you put your car out and other people can rent that car uh, hourly, for a day, over a weekend, when you're away, and so on. And uh, recently, I visited these uh, various places. So last year, I traveled uh, uh, to, uh, uh, internationally. And uh, in all the places I visited, there's actually a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, car sharing. So this, this has taken hold not only in the US, but also uh, uh, elsewhere. Uh, uh, let's see. So some of this stuff is driven by uh, bottom-up, sort of the peer-peer -peer thing, driven uh, by, by its own, facilitated by these platforms. Uh, but manufacturers of these, uh, of these, uh, of these assets, uh, and I'll show a few examples, are also getting into the action, right? So Ford recently launched a pilot program of peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer car sharing, where they allow um, individuals who bought Ford cars finance through Ford Credit uh, to, uh, to, to rent their, to put their cars out for rent, uh, and Ford will facilitate this process. And the income generated through these short-term rentals then goes, goes toward the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the monthly payments for your car. Right, it's not entirely clear why Ford would find this uh, a meaningful thing to do because conceivably it's competing, right? So it's creating a secondary market for it. Uh, but uh, the folks I talked to at Ford mentioned they just, they just want to be in the space. They want to learn about what's, what's at stake here. They want to maybe learn more about the, uh, their, own, uh, their, own, uh, their own customers. Uh, we're involved in a project with China Mobile where um, uh, China Mobile operates in Hong Kong, and recently they have launched this program where they allow individuals who bought in into these data plans, right? You can have a high data plan, a low data plan, and there's often anxiety, right? If you buy into the low data plan, you run out of data at the end of the month. If you buy into a high data plan, you could have excess data, uh, right? Uh, so China Mobile launched this program that allows their customers to actually trade data, right? So if you need data, you can go onto the platform uh, and buy data from those who have excess data, okay? So this is the sharing economy meets um, um, mobile telecommunication, if you may. We're also involved in a project with uh, Stratasys. Uh, where, um, so recently Stratus announced a peer-to-peer -peer capacity sharing platform uh, that allows its customers to share access capacity on machines they own. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Stratasys, but this is a local company. It's a leading uh, manufacturer of 3D printers, okay? So 3D printers are, uh, are an excellent example, right, of this expensive assets uh, that tends to be poorly utilized. So 3D printing is typically used either by individuals or, or, or companies that, that have uh, 3D printing needs, usually at the design stage, at the prototyping stage, right? Uh, and so there's, um, there's, uh, the need is there, but it's the, the usage is intermittent, okay? So what Stratasys is doing is creating this platform that leverages that excess capacity that many of its customers have on their machines so to, to rent it out to others who may not own machines or others whose usage, right, doesn't, um, right, uh, when you have uh, a dip in your own usage, somebody else might have a peak. Uh, I was going to do a little demo of, so this is a partnership with 3D Hubs. 
And 3D Hubs is um, this uh, company, you can think of it as the Uber of 3D printing. It has, uh, uh, for hobbyists, uh, and so there are a lot of people who buy these three, these, these uh, 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 affordable, cheap 3D printers, right? A few thousand dollars, you can go to uh, a retail store and buy one. So again, these hobbyists also would not have a lot of use for them. 3D Hubs found this business opportunity where they now have managed to connect 50,000 owners of 3D printers around the world uh, uh, where you can put your machine up on this network and people can submit jobs. Uh, so those who don't own 3D printers can submit jobs and have them printed and then there's a, there's a, there's you can go pick it up, they can send it to you and so on. And this is present again everywhere in the world. Uh, so I was going to do a little demo here of, uh, so I, uh, this morning I looked and there are a list within 20 mile radius, there's, um, there's over 100 3D printers, owners of 3D printers connected on the network. I was recently in Doha, Qatar, and the Volpa, I said for sure there will not be people on the 3D hub uh, network, and surely there were, uh, there were 10 people within a 10 mile radius in Doha, same Taiwan in Taiwan, uh, and so on. Okay, so the promise of the sharing economy, um, and uh, keep me on time, okay? Uh, uh, the promise of the sharing economy is that you, again, uh, for, for owners, right, you generate income, monetizing this expensive asset, in some cases rapidly depreciating, in the case of 3D printers, for example, technology is evolving, uh, uh, provide access to those who may otherwise prefer not to own this expensive asset, as champions of uh, the sharing economy will say this is a more sustainable way of, uh, of, con of consuming because potentially reduce the number of owners. Uh, in the case of cars, fewer cars means lower emissions, less congestion, less need for parking. Creates positive social interaction, help build community. Uh, a source also of flexible income, employment, right? Uh, provide a decide uh, when to work, where to work, how much to work. So there's a segment of the population that may not want to work full time. Uh, consumers enjoy higher level of service because the platform are more effective at matching supply and demand, right? Uh, they rely on a large pool of assets and workers. They have this flexibility in pricing, um, in compensation, right? You, can, you, can, you, have, you have levers that the traditional employers may not have. Um, it's also been a great opportunity, as you saw from that picture with all these businesses, a great opportunity for, for entrepreneurship, innovation, right? So um, whenever there are these high value but poorly utilized assets, right, if you can think of such an asset, there's a, then there's, there's a potentially an opportunity to, to build a business around it. Okay, so that's the, the propaganda, if you may, about the sharing economy. Uh, to what extent does, um, does the sharing economy deliver on this promise? So this, this is how I personally got involved in thinking about the sharing economy. We were doing work on, on sustainability and this issue of whether sharing economy type, uh, uh, the sharing economy way of thinking about consumption is indeed more sustainable or not. Uh, here's, a, here's a quote from the New York Times. Uh, a recent one, okay, uh, let's see, what does it say? So, the average daytime speed of cars in Manhattan, uh, business district has fallen to just under eight miles per hour this year, 2015, from about 9.15 uh, miles per hour in 2009, so a significant drop in, in speed. And city officials says that car services like Uber and Lyft are partly to blame. And uh, so Mayor Bill de Blasio proposed to cap their growth, okay? So, the, the, the thing that's been observed is that the, all this injection, tens of thousands of Uber cars, these black cars that are now circling Manhattan, slowing things down. Uh, so, I don't know if you guys followed the story, but there was a huge pushback from Uber, and they managed to line up. So, this is the community aspect of the sharing economy also. They managed to have a petition signed by hundreds of thousands of people, and then this has been tabled, this effort has been tabled for now. Uh, when I was in uh, Taipei, the headline that day was um, 
about uh, also Uber, Taiwan's Ministry of Transportation and Communication, planning to press criminal charges to stop what it feels are illegal ride-sharing services offered by, uh, offered by Uber Taiwan, okay? So um, um, the Taiwanese government views them as a transportation company. Uber's position is that we're, we're saying, we're no, we're an IT, an information technology company. Therefore, we're not subject to the regulation. And I know this afternoon we're going to have a panel around this idea. Same day in the U.S., Seattle, Airbnb fighting concerns that its rentals may squeeze an already tight rental market, worsen local housing affordability by turning homes into perennial short-term rentals, right? So there's this issue that this could create inflation and, um, and speculation and so on. Okay, so this is what I'm calling here the dark side of the sharing economy. There's this mounting concerns. Uh, that the sharing economy could lead to more consumption rather than less, for example, more driving rather than less, because now you're, you're bringing in all these users that were not part of the system, uh, people who are now taking Uber cars instead of taking the metro, for example, Comp uh, competition and fair competition against existing businesses, uh, and fairness to labor leading to what some people are calling the gig economy, where now to get the equivalent of full-time income, you have to stitch together a bunch of these gigs, right? You work for Uber, you drive for Uber, you deliver for Postmates, uh, and then you do errands on TaskRabbit. Um, it's also shifting a lot of risk, a lot of corporate risk, including the ownership of the asset. The demand shocks are now all absorbed by the individual rather than the firm. It could lead to monopolies because of this strong network effect, right? So some people will argue that we're evolving into a world where maybe Uber will become, will, will become all things transportation, right? In the same way that Google has evolved into all things information. Uh, and Amazon wants to evolve into all things physical goods, right? We could end up in that world. Okay, so this brings me to the segment about the five minutes, okay? Uh, initiative, our initiative on the sharing economy. Um, so uh, Lori uh, did a great job describing what we were trying to do. Uh, uh, just to here uh, emphasize that this is a university-wide effort, so we have faculty and a growing number of them uh, across all departments, colleges interested in this. So this has been an exciting topic that's bringing a lot of people together. Uh, we're hoping that this will be um, a partnership with the industry and government and engagement. And this symposium is really our effort to create those connections. So I hope uh, uh, we'll be successful in that. Um, uh, we would like to carry out basic research to develop a better understanding of uh, a deeper understanding of the economics, social implication of the sharing economy. Uh, we, uh, some of us are engineers, computer scientists, and uh, people who do analytics, like to develop analytics to support better decision making at various levels, various stakeholders, consumers, providers, platforms. I'll show you a flavor of what I mean. Uh, hopefully, we'll have time to do that. And then we have an international partner here. I don't know if Costas is here, but we're, some of the work we're doing is in partnership with the university in Singapore. Here are a few examples of, uh, of uh, ongoing projects. There are a few others. I mentioned a few of these, the project on 3D printing, on data trading, but also we, uh, we, have, a, we have a project uh, looking at peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, some implication on consumption usage. Maybe I'll mention a little bit on that. Uh, inventory balancing over a network of shared vehicles, sort of the world that uh, Bill, for example, lives in, where you have distributed the inventory of these assets, and these assets are uh, are access on demand, or because the demand is random, you have to uh, periodically rebalance this inventory. There's a lot of interesting issues there. And then uh, uh, we have some of our participating faculty looking at this idea of cloud mobility, mobility as a service. Okay, all right. So uh, with that, let me just uh, very quickly give you a flavor of some of the research we're doing here. So, so uh, this is, uh, so uh, we've been uh, in the, in the uh, last year building this um, predictive model, if you may, of what would happen if you have peer-to-peer -peer product sharing. What happens if you, uh, what happens if you have peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, for example, okay? So this, uh, this um, 
decision support tool is built around the model where you have these three entities, owners, renters, and a platform. Uh, on one side, the owners, right? The owners are the, the individuals who in the population decide to purchase the, the car, for example. They incur the purchasing costs. But if there's an option now of peer-to-peer -peer sharing, they earn rental income whenever they put their cars out for rent. Uh, they pay commission fee to the platform. Typically, this is how the platform makes, uh, uh, right, uh, generates revenue. Uh, they incur some extra um, wear and tear on their assets. People are not as careful when they drive somebody else's car and they drive their own. And then there's, a prob there's friction in this market, right? When you want a car, for example, and you go to the platform, you may not find one, right? So this is, this is what... Uh, that, that access is not guaranteed, so it's, a, it's an important feature of a lot of these platforms. Uh, renters, on the other hand, pay a rental fee, incur an inconvenience cost, and again, there's this friction on the other side, finding an available car is not always guaranteed, and the platform is in the middle, kind of manipulating supply and demand by deciding or guiding prices, as well as uh, setting uh, uh, membership fees, commissions, and so on. Okay, so we, we try, given that you have now this option in an economy of people uh, sharing, uh, sharing assets, right? So some people may decide, given that this sharing, uh, sharing is an option, I will forego ownership. Um, others may, who, have, who, who were not owners before, may actually, now that they can share their asset, or that the asset is shareable, they could decide that they now maybe should own a car, right? Because they could generate income from it. Um, okay, so uh, I, will not, um, I will not show any math. <laughs> uh, but let me share with you a couple of uh, interesting findings and then I'll stop, okay? So one of our findings is, uh, right, we were after this question of sustainability, uh, what happens to ownership and usage, for example. What we, uh, what we found, what the model predicts is that peer-to-peer -peer sharing can lead to either higher or lower ownership and higher or lower usage depending on the rental fee, but also interestingly on the cost of ownership, okay? And what's particularly, what was initially surprising to us is that when the cost of ownership is high, you're more likely, when you introduce a peer-to-peer -peer sharing, and sharing in general, uh, option, actually ownership goes up, and usage goes up rather than down, okay? And the, I mean, if you think about it for a minute, the intuition is immediate. There, when the cost of ownership is high of a particular asset, all right, I was in Singapore for a few years where owning a car was ridiculously expensive. It was like owning a Toyota Corolla was like 200,000, uh, equivalent to 200,000 US dollars. Okay, so cost of ownership is very high there. Very few people own. So the question actually was, uh, the Singapore government approached us about this, was if you're now you're gonna encourage sharing, right? Uh, because you're gonna increase access and maybe that's a desire, socially desirable thing, what's gonna happen, okay? Um, uh, but they're also very mindful of keeping a lid on ownership, a number of cars in the system. This predicts that ownership will actually go up rather than down. And the reason because now people can afford to buy a car. This car that was ridiculously expensive, because of the rental income that you're going to generate, you can use that rental income to subsidize the ownership of the car. And given that you're more or less guaranteed to find renters because they're very limited, right? Few people own cars, then that effect is compounded. Okay, uh, maybe I'll stop here and just uh, go to my last slide. Okay, uh, so the sharing economy and more broadly the on-demand economy uh, could affect in fundamental ways uh, uh, the way we live, consume, interact with each other. Uh, there's an opportunity, it seems, to tap into these vast reserves of poorly utilized assets across many domains. Significant opportunity for innovation, entrepreneurship, particularly for a place like the university, one could think about these new creative ways of how we could uh, do a better job at uh, tapping into this uh, right, uh, reserve. Of, uh, and then policymakers need to be aware of the economic societal implications, environment, labor, consumer, welfare, and that the answers may be subtle, right? They may be nuanced, uh, and that we should uh, be mindful that, uh, right, uh, that uh, 
things may not go according to, um, uh, to what the advocates on either side uh, will tell us. Final thoughts? Um, a question here from sort of to, to get us uh, going, thinking about this uh, uh, and the broader issues is peer-to-peer -peer sharing, another form of resource sharing, the first stage in an evolution uh, toward an economy where we own very little and access everything. Uh, and if so, what kind of society would this be? Uh, is it necessarily more egalitarian, democratic, sustainable? I'll leave you with that. That's our future. Yes, yeah, I mean, it'll be, I think, important to validate, um, right, some of these insights that are coming out of a model, this, these predictions about what's gonna happen to ownership and usage with uh, actual data. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of these models are nascent and there's just not, there's just still not a big enough part of the economy, right, uh, to make a difference either way. Um, Yes. Yeah, yeah, that would be, that would be, ter that would be terrific, yes. So a partners not only in data, but also on problems, on issues, um, opportunities where maybe sharing is, is a way to, uh, to do things. Yeah. Hannah. Hi, yeah. I work for Hennepin County, <laughs> and we have been um, studying baby boomers and seniors and um, the fact that they have fewer resources than generations in the past and how are people gonna get around and that a lot of the boomers live in the outer suburbs beyond the Musa so we don't have transit out there and how, how are they gonna get around as they age and need to go to clinical appointments, et cetera. So we were looking at Uber and just kind of talking about a bunch of different things and um, looked at New York City and, and some other jurisdictions and, and how one of the issues is that while there are a lot of Ubers out there, there are very few that take handicapped. And so kind of the egalitarian piece and government still needing to step in, still needing to provide services, and those services being incredibly expensive compared to services for everyone else. Mm -hmm. So just looking for some thoughts on that. Yeah, so I don't know if you, there was a, a recently a story in the news about uh, this town in Florida that was contemplating um, uh, providing um, mobility services for, for the, the kind of groups you mentioned, and instead they decided to just go with Uber just to have, uh, to basically pay for Uber services for, um, uh, for the people they were intending. It was a much more economical than invest in buses, the infrastructure that goes with that, um, vans, uh, repairs, et cetera. So one, one model is to outsource some of these things to these service providers. In the same way, for example, I, we're here at the University of Minnesota, we have outsourced most of our IT services to Google. Our email service, for example, is now in the hands of Google and other things, our cloud storage, et cetera. So there might be an opportunity for such partnership. So that's thought I, number one. I, part of the question, though, is that a lot of people need wheelchair accessible vans, and there are very few. So right. that's part of right. the question there. Yeah. Thanks. So I, I think, yeah, I'm not, uh, not going to advocate for Uber, or, or, but some of these um, uh, service providers have now, uh, are offering options for access to, uh, uh, for, um, um, but, but I think your, your larger points about the sharing economy and equity, I think, is, is an important one. So there was a recent study that showed that there's a strong racial bias. Uh, Airbnb, for example, if you're African, if you have an African sounding name, for example, your chances are of, 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 of a host accepting you are significantly lower even if the host happens to be African-American. So there's, a, I mean, there's a, this discussion of whether the sharing economy is gonna leave behind a part of, the, of society because of, because of that, but also because of you need to be savvy about this technology, you need to be plugged in, and so on. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, 
uh, I want to talk about the barrier to entry for these type of companies because you see that there's a big dominance for very few companies that are doing the, this uh, economy of sharing. Uh, what do you, can you comment about this barrier? Uh, you know, like Uber is kind of dominating or A Airbnb is dominating in these areas. And uh, just to let you know that Google now is paying you to sit in their autonomous car and so you can go places and do the economy uh -huh. of sharing. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, so barriers. So, I mean, building these apps is not, is not difficult, right? Um, but many of these apps, I mean, there are competing services with, or, with Uber, but many of these apps don't go anywhere, right? Because to be successful, you need uh, these, um, these scales, right? this network effect. I mean, the whole idea is built on that you're gonna leverage, for example, if you're relying on a flexible workforce for people to come in and work for the platform in a flexible way, that system will only work if there is a sufficiently large mass. So building mass and competing for mass is a big thing. Uh, building market share, right, their Uber is, is that's what they're laser focused on. And often they subsidize, right, they, their, their initial stages so Uber entered China recently, and where there's an existing competing ride-hailing um, um, uh, uh, service there uh, that's established, and they've been heavily subsidizing the fares and so on, right? So that bill, if, but only Uber could do sustain that that kind of subsidy for for a long time. So it's, there's in, indeed it's a concern. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so you're not going to get any models from me at all. In fact, I'm going to ask you to make a bunch of assumptions. Um, I'm not an academic. Uh, what I want to address is this is happening. What are we going to do about it? So I want you to make a couple assumptions. The first assumption is that local bus service disappears. You are not going to have any scheduled routes uh, you, that are on your little streets. On your big streets, you'll still have rapid buses that are taking you downtown. But the local stuff disappears. Why? because it's gonna be mobility on demand. You're gonna request a trip, and you're gonna want that trip to come pick you up on your block within three, between three and seven minutes. So that already happens. It's not just Uber. So if you go down to Eden Prairie, uh, Southwest Transit already has their prime service. They're doing that today with, with five buses. The other thing that I want you to assume is that there are more people using uh, this mobility on demand than we currently have because people are going to own less cars. You don't have to take my uh, words for it. Today's Star Tribune, 550,000 less cars in five years than we're selling today. Why? Because people are going to want to use these services. And the last assumption is that people aren't going to make sacrifices. We are still going to um, play uh, traveling soccer. We're still going to have people that live in Eden Prairie and work one uh, spouse in downtown and the other spouse in Woodbury. So we're gonna keep moving around. So you know, where does that leave us? Um, a couple of big questions. So the first big question is, are we gonna um, replace the trips that used to happen on those local buses with individual trips that are individual Ubers and individual autonomous cars? Are we going to find a way to get lots more people in each vehicle? And then the second big question is, are we going to serve every neighborhood the same? Or are we going to prefer, are we going to give more mobility on demand to the neighborhoods that are the easiest to serve? Um, big answer to those questions is about big data. The largest possible pool of data uh, meaning the largest number of real-time trip requests, if we can pull that and give it to the largest number of operators, we have the best chance to get more people in every vehicle and to use the vehicle fleet that we have in the most efficient way. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And, and the second is, 
we need to create ways for government to influence these operators to get to every neighborhood, not just to the ones that are easiest to serve or the most lucrative to serve. So the question for policymakers for this group today, in my mind, is not how do we regulate this changing economy with the existing tools we have, the existing government structures we have, but rather how do we seize this opportunity and optimize for a seismic shift in the way we get around. So what's the best governance model to do that? We've done this before. So let's go back to 1956. We passed the Interstate Highway Bill. We start building all kinds of highways. We've got rapid neighborhood change. We've got suburban sprawl. What do we do? We created in 1967 the Met Council. We created this urban growth boundary. We created regional decision making because we were about um, how do we uh, do the best job of building infrastructure in this you know, seismic shift that occurred because personal automobiles were available to everyone. When I was in law school and planning school, we pointed to Minneapolis, to the Met Council as like the, the leading example of the smart way to do this. But let's think about maybe there's a mismatch between the goals that we identified back in 1967 and where we are today. So then it was all about suburban growth. We had more and more three-car garages. Um, today it's about re-urbanization. We've got more people moving back into the city. Both Minneapolis and St. Paul are growing in population for the first time in many years. Back then it was about building new infrastructure. Um, today, when we're talking about um, how do we optimize this system? It's about big data, and it's about building the best interface so we can make uh, people want to use this mobility on demand service rather than owning their car. Back in 1967, it was about building a huge labor force that was gonna drive all those buses and getting more diversity and fair pay, all the things that were critically important uh, back in the, the late 60s. Today, very, very different. We are looking at autonomous vehicles, so getting the people out of the vehicle to, all together, and a whole new workforce of independent contractors who are currently working for Uber. So the, the framework has totally changed. And then lastly, uh, it was about fair procurement. How are we gonna make it so that when we're building this highway and buying the cement, we're not uh, favoring one contractor over another. We're making everybody have a shot at this and today it's very different because we're doing much more with public-private partnerships. And so how do we build partnerships in a way that are gonna allow us to work with very, very fast-changing technology? So where we used to be worried about building something that was gonna last for 50 years and what's the fairest way to do that, today we're focused on the cycle of development. What is the best way to work with companies that are investing billions of dollars into technology that changes like that, and some of it gets abandoned, uh, and some of it moves forward, and government has to be able to work with them. So that's what I'm gonna focus on, is the public-private partnership side of this. You're gonna get my observations from a couple of experiences I've had with the bike share world, and what I'm gonna do is um, come back at the end of this and say, uh, if we were to use public-private partnership to kind of achieve these, uh, the public goals around getting um, more people in every vehicle and creating equitable uh, service, how would we create that public-private partnership? So my experience, um, early December of 2008, uh, I was in front of the Minneapolis City Council with a business plan, a non, the first nonprofit business plan for bike share. I had a million dollar sponsor in Blue Cross, and I was asking the city to apply for a $2 million grant to create this new nonprofit. The critical thing that we were proposing is that the city would never have to put a single dollar in operating costs into our nonprofit. They bought it, we started, and you know, here we are seven years later um, with a bike share system that now has bikes that are starting to get old. Uh, but, uh, not only that, we have 60 bike share systems around the, the US. I ended up uh, being the first president of the National Bike Share Association. So this is a, a product that has really taken off. 
Um, at that same meeting, uh, some of you know Sarah Harris. Um, Sarah was uh, pitching the vote on the creation of the Downtown Improvement District. So the Downtown Improvement District is basically businesses within the core of downtown saying, we want to tax ourselves to take over responsibility for keeping downtown well-maintained. And the issue was really about labor. Um, the, the core issue for a very liberal council to deal with at the time was, should they uh, go forward with the downtown improvement district knowing that they weren't gonna be subject to the same laws that govern the labor for public sector employees? So that, and this is what Sarah was arguing at the time, I need to be able to have the same person change that light bulb, remove that graffiti, and take the gum off the ground. I can't have to call three different union employees to do that. That passed. And so let's look now at where we are today with you know, these new public-private private partnerships that we created back in 2008. Going to the bike share world, we have two primary models. Um, one is like Nice Ride Minnesota. We are a nonprofit owner-operator. Uh, the other is a concession model. So if you go to the largest cities in the US, New York or Washington DC, um, the cities own their bike share equipment and they contract with a for-profit operator to run those systems. Um, what I'd like to do is touch on the big picture and then some of the things that have worked well and not well for those two types of structures. Um, the big picture is that the, um, in both, we've been able to get a lot of contribution from the private sector. We have major sponsorships, um, and we have gotten re-ups of those sponsorships. So for example, in New York, Citibank is right back in. We just signed a five-year contract with Blue Cross and Blue Shield, so we've been able to, to maintain that level of support. It wasn't just a one-time thing when we were starting something that was shiny and new. Um, the other is that we have been able to grow and maintain during a period where there was huge instability in the technology and in the companies that were selling us the, the technology. So the biggest distributor of bike share equipment in the world went bankrupt in the middle of this huge growth cycle, and it really didn't slow us down very long. So the public-private partnership was nimble in that way. A little bit about the nonprofit model, the model of Nice Ride Minnesota. It has been great for small cities because we've been able to leverage contributions from lots of different folks. Uh, so we are able to get um, you know, downtown professionals. We're able to get uh, folks that are really worried about, am I gonna be able to recruit great employees to downtown? We're able to get the health industry. We're able to get um, support from the hospitality industry. So that's worked really well. Uh, like I said, we've also been nimble. We've been good at creating public trust, so creating brands that people like. Um, that's been a strong point. But some of these nonprofits have really struggled, and one of their challenges has been about small thinking. So um, when you're working in an area that's about new technology or untried uh, ideas, you have to be willing to fail. You have to be willing to fail fast in some cases. That's what entrepreneurs do. Nonprofits often don't want to take uh, the kind of risks that you need to take. So they're, they're running one program, it has to work. Um, if you look at what Ford's doing right now, they've got 500 different programs they're trying in the shared economy. They only want one of them to work, or they only need one of them to work. Um, so small thinking is one of them. The other is that when the nonprofits have gotten too close to government, so that when their board uh, looks more like an interagency task force than kind of an independent board that is trying to solve problems, they have been better at admiring problems than in solving problems. So a, a nonprofit really has to be set up uh, to get over hurdles, not to identify the hurdles for themselves. And we've seen a number of them fail for that reason. Now going to the, the concession model, um, here what you're doing is you're bidding for, or you're taking bids for someone to come in and operate a, a very large bike share system. And those are great for getting a new system up and running in a big city fast. Um, but they haven't worked in large cities at all because they are dependent on, or they haven't worked in smaller cities because they're dependent on a large volume of riders and they're dependent on some ad values that are higher than you can get even here in Minneapolis. So for example, Detroit, 
uh, just did their RFP for a bike share system. You know, the, the company that's operating the systems in New York and DC didn't even bid on that one. It wasn't big enough for them. Um, some of the areas where they've really struggled have been incentive alignment. So what you need to do when you draft a concession agreement is make sure your contractor is uh, incented to deliver the kind of service that you want to see on the street. With the nonprofits, that wasn't such a big deal because we don't succeed if you know, we're not providing a decent service. Um, that wasn't true with the way that a lot of those initial performance contracts were written for the concession agreements. Um, the other area where they've really struggled is on this cycle of development, on the um, dealing with technology that is changing. And this has a lot to do with the way the public sector uh, procures just about everything. Um, they put out a bid, uh, and their goal is that they won't have to go back and rebid that thing for another 10 years or whatever the cycle is going to be. That is not the way things work uh, in bike share technology or in so many different areas of the sharing economy where we are relying on changes in user interfaces over time. Um, technology changes very, very fast, and the participants in the uh, supplying the technology change fast. So um, the concession model has really struggled uh, because they bought equipment and then not been able to uh, uh, upgrade it or stay connected to the cycle of development. All right, so that's enough about bike share. I'm going to now turn to the downtown improvement district. You know, one of the things that I think is most fascinating about that group is they, um, again, were created uh, at a time where they were arguing for um, being exempt for some of the labor rules. But if you look at the workforce they've put on the street in Minneapolis, it is probably one of the most diverse workforces that you're going to see in any company in the city. Um, when I sat down with Steve Kramer, who is the executive director there, and asked him about some of the successes, one of the things that he pointed to is that um, by creating a forum for the most interested stakeholders, so the targets, the US banks, the Wells Fargo's, a place where they, they don't control, but they can exert some influence, um, they are able to leverage a, a huge amount of expertise and commitment from those major stakeholders. So not only did they uh, decide to tax themselves back in 2008, they have continued to add more projects to the downtown improvement district. And uh, we've got lots of examples of that. So most recently, you have the Commons Park right by the stadium. Uh, there's been a question of who was going to own that. The Minneapolis Park Board said they didn't want to. The DID was tasked with solving that problem, and they've done it in a very, very flexible way. I was amazed to see trees planted out there last week. Um, another key point that Steve made is that this entity has been far less risk averse than a government uh, would be in operating downtown. They have tried lots more things, and they have been in this kind of constant uh, process of improvement. They've tried things that have failed. They've used equipment that they didn't like. They've uh, uh, you know, in a constant optimization mode. OK, so I know this is a little bit disjointed, but those are my experiences with public-private partnership. My, where I end up on those is there's a lot of things that work, are powerful about public-private partnership, but it really matters how you put them together. So when I look at this question of how are we going to avoid the situation where our city is completely gridlocked by Uber drivers and autonomous vehicles, um, I think, how do I create a public-private partnership that's going to let me create this large pool and let the public sector send the price signals or the incentives that are going to keep us from getting into a, a, a situation that where it's not fair for everybody. And the, uh, the proposal that we've talked about is let's create a marketplace, uh, a clearinghouse where uh, millions of real-time trip requests are coming into a central location and can be shared with the public sector, can be shared with private sector entrepreneurs that are huge, like Uber, but could also be shared with brand new uh, players in this market, and that the operators in the market can work together to bid the best solution 
uh, to the passenger. And that might be intermodal. So you might, example of what they're doing already down in South, at the Southwest Transit, you might uh, be in a smaller vehicle to go from your home with two or three other people on your block to where you get on a bus that takes you downtown. And that might be operated, one might be operated by the public sector and one by the private sector. So what I wanted to talk through here is what are some of the criteria, what are some of the concerns that would go into creating a public-private partnership like that? I think one of the biggest one is data security and privacy. Um, the vision that I think uh, we would be operating under is that the public sector, or the, I'm sorry, the, the entity, the uh, public-private partnership, would need to create a standard for operators to participate in this auction. So they'd have to set a minimum criteria for how you're going to protect my data. Um, so I, and I have to sign on to that. But then on the other end, as a user, I'm probably going to opt in to only certain users can get my data. I have, may have great faith in Metro Transit. I may trust Uber, but I may not want it to go to people that I've never heard of before. So I could limit who's going to get my trip request, who can bid on my trip downtown. Another idea that I thought was really critical is um, neutrality, that this auction, this clearinghouse that we're going to create cannot be an operator. They can't be a funder. They can't do all the things that Metro Transit is, is currently doing right now. They would need to be created as an independent entity to create that marketplace. And there are examples of that. So in the power industry, we have created um, clearing houses or uh, auctions where um, uh, companies that generate power, uh, the powers all of our houses, can sell that into marketplaces, and um, the local power co-ops can, can buy that power. Uh, I think we could create kind of the same thing for transportation. One of the things drawing from the Downtown Improvement District is that when we create that neutral body, we need to let uh, the largest stakeholders have the ability to influence, but not to totally control it, uh, so that we have their buy-in. Um, so again, looking at the board of the Downtown Improvement District, it is a huge board. Almost every entity that, uh, business that is downtown has some involvement on that board. Um, and it is not dominated by, by the public sector. It is not in any way a, an interagency task force. Um, uh, but there is a forum for the, uh, the targets and the US banks that have the largest interest to participate. And the way they do that is by their roles, for example, being chair of a committee or something like that. Um, let's see. Another. Yep, I'm almost done. Two more cards. <laughs> Another key aspect here for me is that we need a way for the public sector to um, influence the market with price signals and with incentives. So for example, if um, uh, we have a clearinghouse that enables um, uh, any entity to um, respond to your trip request by saying, I can get you to, from your home to downtown for $12 and I'll be there in four minutes. Um, if uh, that originated in North Minneapolis, the public sector might be able to put in a 50% or a $5 contribution, or they might be able to penalize uh, people that uh, did not take a certain number of trips from an area. So there, there could be lots of ways that a neutral body could incentivize or penalize um, uh, to achieve equity goals. Another key one for me is that we need to be able to take advantage of dynamic pricing. So we saw in San Francisco that you um, could get great um, benefits in the usage of public parking spaces when you could uh, use demand pricing. So people would that uh, were willing to walk a little further would pay less, and people that really wanted and needed the premium parking spot would pay more. Um, we want to be able to send those signals through a clearinghouse. And then finally, um, I think we could incentivize paratransit and incentivize active transportation through a system like this as well. And then the last point, I think uh, 
uh, Saif really pointed out that the user interface is what this is all about. Um, and Uber's done a fantastic job in creating one user interface. Do we want to let them be the entity that controls that forever? Or is it smarter for the public sector to get engaged uh, in the form of, for example, an ISO standard to create um, a format so that lots of entities, we could create, for example, the browser wars of the transportation interface. Maybe we're not going to have 100 of them, but we might have a few that would be in constant competition to be the best Google or the best you know, Firefox. So that, that ends my thoughts on what a public-private partnership for optimizing um, transportation changes might be. Questions? Take these off. Hi, John Doan with Hennepin County. Uh, I think this ties both what Bill, what you were saying, as well as a question from a previous uh, from the previous speaker, which revolves around paratransit. Mm -hmm. um, I'm one of the proud founders of a new nonprofit called Self Driving MN, and uh, we're helping to champion a bill that's working through the legislative session this year that would look to create a task force and also have a demonstration of self-driving vehicles here in Minnesota to serve people with disabilities. And um, one of the things that we're tr struggling with is, as we think about what the various business options are, business models for that provision of that public need, should it be a nonprofit model? Should it be a clearinghouse model? Mm -hmm. Should it be a, uh, a private model? Or, or it could be contracted as it currently is for Metro Mobility and other paratransit services. Can you provide some insight as to what you think, uh, you know, just in that, you know, kind of top of mind reaction, what do you think the right model to provide a service like paratransit should be in the Twin Cities? So I'm going to answer in two ways. So one is that we should not start with the status quo and assume that small tinkering to it is going to be the optimum way. I think that we need to think big right now. And then secondarily, I would say we're spending a ton of money right now on uh, paratransit. It, it's not an efficient system, and we don't do a very good job of it. Um, it takes a long time to, uh, if, if you are in a wheelchair, uh, it's a very expensive service that, you know, doesn't often work very well for people. If we were to put some small incentives into place, uh, I believe that we could dramatically change that. Uh, so if we were to pay Uber and Lyft or 100 other uh, potential entities to do this um, and did it in real time, they would buy the right vehicles that could move those ve uh, wheelchairs. And it would probably end up being a lot cheaper because their labor costs are so much lower than the people that are driving those vehicles today. Community Comfrey School. Uh, we've worked with MnDOT on their, both their MnPass lanes and also exploring an alternative to the gas tax to fund the transportation system. Based on your experience in working with the city of Minneapolis on parts of the transportation problem, what kind of advice would you give to MnDOT um, in terms of, I mean, they, contr they control a huge amount of assets in terms of the road system and you know, and it seems like the platform technology and the kinds of things we're talking about creates really an opportunity. But, you know, how do they as a government agency, what's the best way to, to interact with the kinds of things that you're talking about here? My sense, if I were uh, at MnDOT right now, I would feel like I'm a giant ship that's being asked to turn around and point the other direction. Uh, because you know we have, for 50 years, been about adding lanes. And adding lanes, in my mind, based on what I read in the newspaper today, is a really dumb thing to do. Uh, that we will have fewer cars used in a more efficient way. That's the assumption for this presentation. Uh, but I think it's, it's backed up. Um, and uh, and th that I think that's what we need to be planning for. Um, and I think MnDOT has to be figuring out how they can not only partner with the local partners that are, for example, heavily involved in downtown Minneapolis through the DID, like the Targets or US Bank, but how are we going to partner with 
um, Google and Daimler and these other companies that are bringing tremendous resources to the cities that they are investing in right now. So if you're Austin or you're San Francisco. I think my view is you need to start from scratch and say, what are my goals? Um, my goal would be more people in every vehicle and a tool to deliver incentives. I would start with those two goals. And then I would say, what is the structure that's going to get me there? I just gave you my opinion on that. I think you should hire some smart lawyers, like the ones that developed uh, the Met Council way back in 1967, and say, what is the best business structure the best governance structure to get us there today. All right, last question. I'm Frank Dalma, uh, also with the Humphrey School. Um, Bill, I'm just uh, wondering, you presented a very uh, innovative idea about how to uh, reorganize things here. I presume that group would need to run on some kind of budget of its mm -hmm. own. Would this uh, come from a small fee that's attached to each market rate ride or some, and, and possibly that is also then used to subsidize the, the low income rides or provide incentives or do you have, have you thought through where that comes from? Um, I haven't really. I mean, the way I think about it is, uh, you know, MnDOT has a question of whether in the next 20 years they need to add a lane on I-94 and looking at what the, you know, it's going to cost over a billion dollars and be incredibly disruptive if you ended up having to do that. And it wipes out all kinds of opportunities that we've been looking at in terms of capping highways to put parking for the new stadium or whatever you may want to do to reconnect neighborhoods that have been long not connected. So. There's a huge savings to not building those lanes. Where do we come up with the dollars today? To tell you the truth, I don't know, but I also don't think it's that hard because their private foundation, you know, I've been doing this for five years in the little bike share world, and we've been able to raise millions and millions of dollars as bike share entities. When we look at the fact that General Motors just put $500 million into Lyft and the other numbers that are quoted in the paper today, there is huge private sector investment going into this with a relatively small public in investment, we can uh, make some real progress, I believe.